All right, and we are setting up on YouTube. All right, we're officially live on YouTube. So let me drop the link in the chat. Um, so Melody, um, oh, and we have another participant who just joined us. Hi, welcome. As um, as you all come into the um, to our event, feel free to drop in the chat. You know who you are, where you're calling in from. Um, you know your zip code, if possible, so we can keep track of who we're reaching and maybe something you're excited to learn about during this webinar. We're currently recording and we're also streaming live to YouTube. So you'll be able to access the recording immediately after the webinar. I'm posting it on social media too. Caroline, you want to check and see if Melody uh, is familiar with the chat window and whatnot real quick? Uh, looks like she is. She replied, OK, thanks, which is good. And it looks like we have some other people who just joined us, too. Hey, everybody, as you come on in, please don't be shy. Introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from, something you're excited to learn about during this webinar. Um, we're also currently posting the live stream on YouTube. So if you have friends or family who can't tune in on Zoom and you want them to join you on YouTube, they can do that too. So I just dropped the YouTube link in the chat. And we're about one minute towards um, until start time. So that's great. And um, if you do use the chat pod, we ask that you use all panelists and attendees as your two, um, just so everybody can see your chats. Um, we've had different online events where there have been some really exciting conversations in the chat, and we'd love to keep that up here. And we'll also stop periodically during this presentation for questions, so you don't have to worry about um, your questions being answered. We'll make sure we get to them. Um, yeah, we got Christine, we have Pamela. It looks like Chris G just joined us. Hey, everybody, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Awesome. Um, someone asked, are we automatically muted? You are indeed automatically muted. Um, we just That's why we have our chat open, so we can make sure that we see all your questions, um, all your comments, things you're interested in learning about. And um, yeah, don't, don't be shy about uh, chiming in on the chat. Um, since it is 2 o'clock, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are in the penultimate day of Citizen Science Month, the uh, second to last. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, Citizen Science Month ran all through April, and um, because of current public health concerns, Citizen Science Month was completely online. So we encouraged people to tune into online events like this one. We hoped that they would do projects like Bud Burst in their backyard, our um, projects like stall catchers from, you know, from their computers. Um, and overall, we just wanted to provide opportunities for people to connect and still do citizen science and feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves while also staying safe. So we're going to get things started with a live poll. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch this. Um, all are welcome on this webinar. We made it um, purposefully so it could, we could introduce people of different skill levels um, to this project, Bud First. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Um, have you participated in a citizen science project before? So don't be shy. Make sure you vote. All right, we have our votes coming in. And for those of you who are tuning in via the YouTube live stream, um, unfortunately, you cannot vote. But um, we'd love if you could comment in the YouTube comments, and we'll monitor those as well. 
Um, so it looks like everybody's voted. So I'm going to go ahead and end our poll. And we have an interesting 50-50 split. About half have participated in citizen science before, and the other half are no or not sure. So good to know. I'm going to share the results just so you all can see that. Awesome stuff. All right, and then we'll move on to our next poll question. So we just want to learn a little bit more about you. So I'm going to pull this up. So are you a citizen scientist, a parent of an aspiring citizen scientist, a formal educator, an informal educator, a researcher, a librarian, a part of a library staff, um, just a bored person on the internet? Those are welcome too. Our and unfortunately, our panelists cannot vote. So sorry, Jean, uh, Carolyn, and Jennifer. All right, last chance to vote. Three, two, one, end poll. Share results. So it looks like the majority of people here are formal educators, which is good to know. But we also have an informal educator on the line, a citizen scientist, a parent. Um, we do have a board person on the internet, which great, you're welcome. We're glad you're here too. And we have a researcher here. So it's an interesting spread of people. And we hope you all find something um, that you enjoy about this presentation. So, and then we have one more poll question. Um, we want to know about your audience. So this question is most relevant to, you know, our educators and researchers on the line. So who are your primary audiences? Are you working with high schoolers, college graduates, adults? Let us know. All right, last chance to vote. And we'll end the poll. Share results. It looks like the majority of people either work with fourth through eighth grade are adults. So that's good to know. So we do have pre-K through grade three and high school um, audiences um, that we need to think about too during this presentation. So I'm gonna stop with the polls now. So this is, I, hi, I'm Caroline. If you know, throughout this presentation, you wanna share your excitement on Twitter, um, on Facebook, on Instagram, feel free to tag me and tag SciStarter and any of our other awesome partners on the line like Chicago Botanic or Project Budverse. Um, we'd love to hear more about it. And by posting on social media, that's the best way for people to find out about citizen science and get involved. So I mentioned that we're at the end of citizen science month, even though April's about to end, citizen science won't. So you can keep on participating throughout the entire year. Um, and SciStarter is here to help you do that. So some of you haven't participated in citizen science before. So I just want you to think about citizen science as a collaboration. That's how I always frame it. It's between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. So that can be um, turning your curiosity into impact. Let's say you really care about flowers and seasons, and you know, you're very curious about it, and you want to be part of knowledge creation and um, helping us better understand the world. You can get involved in the Citizen Science Project, and you can do that. Um, these are our Sit Sci Month partners. Um, we actually have a webinar tomorrow night with National Geographic, so feel free to join, especially for our educators on the line. Um, the awesome team at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, they've been such great supporters, Citizen Science Association, Science Friday, Arizona State School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Um, Citizen Science Month is, has been really inspiring for me to see all these different institutions, groups, individuals come together um, to get the word out about citizen science and get people doing citizen science. So that's our hashtag, hashtag SitSciMonth. And you can also go to citizensciencemonth.org to view recordings from past events um, and to find featured projects you can do from home. Um, and this is a picture of the website there, the citizensciencemonth.org, which is hosted on SciStarter. So Budburst is such an awesome project and I'm so happy that we're um, doing this event with them today. Because, and one reason, um, uh, we're working with them is they're a SciStarter affiliate, which means they've gone the extra mile to be part of our NSF funded SciStarter affiliate program, which allows you to track the number and frequency of your contributions to Budverse and your SciStarter dashboard. So if you have a SciStarter account and then you um, make an account on Budverse, you're able to keep track of, um, oh, I did this many contributions on this day in SciStarter. And that can be really helpful for educators. Let's say you have your students over the you have to be over the age of 13 to have a SciStarter account, but let's say theoretically you have your students all make SciStarter accounts, they're in middle school, and then um, they contribute to Budburst and other projects. You know, let's say you have a health unit, so you have them do stall catchers and do Alzheimer's research. Let's say you have a phonology unit and you have them do Budburst. They can keep track of all these different projects in their dashboard and everybody wins. Um, 
because um, citizen science is so diverse. It's everything from astronomy to zoology and everything in between. And um, by Budverse being a SciStarter affiliate, they're able to be part of that um, ecosystem of projects and making the world a better place. So thank you so much to the Budverse team for the amazing work you do. So I'm going to um, yield the floor now to the panelists today. So Jennifer um, Schwartz Ballard, Jean Bryan, and Carolyn Moore. Um, thank you so much to you all, and I can't wait to learn from you. Thank you, Caroline. I am thrilled to be here to share a little bit about our Budverse Community Science Program and how you can participate. So as Caroline mentioned, if you have questions as I'm talking, you can post them in the chat. And we have some breaks throughout the presentation where we'll take time to answer some of those questions that do come up. Next. So Budburst is a community science project housed at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It's a national field-based project that aims to save plants, inspire conservation action, and grow a community of plant scientists by encouraging the public to observe plants and how they change with the season. Um, our core mission is to bring together researchers and community scientists on this shared journey to really uncover the stories of plants and ecosystems affected by human impacts on the environment. And that includes climate change. Next. So the project is accessible to all ages from kids on up. Um, we work with individuals, youth groups, community organizations, really anyone who is interested in nature and the environment. Next. So before we drive in, dive into how to participate, I wanted to back up a little bit and tell you about the science behind our project and why it matters. The primary data that our community scientists collect is phenology data. Phenology is the study of the timing of life cycle events, which in plants includes things like when they're flowering, leafing, and fruiting, like in this image of a silver maple. Next. Next. Ah, there we go. Um, so phenology isn't a new area of study. Um, tracking plant phenology has served cultural and scientific and agricultural purposes really for millennia. Um, even now, farmers use phenology to determine when to plant, when to fertilize, or when to harvest crops. We use it to predict allergy seasons and intensity, and wine growers use it to judge when to harvest. Um, next slide. So climate patterns, as you can imagine, can really alter the timing of these events. Plant, plants leaf out and flower earlier in the spring when we have shorter, warmer winters, and shifts like these can really have ecosystem-wide ramifications. And plants don't have the same options in adjusting to these changes as animals do. So plants can adapt via selection. So some individuals of this species might be more fit for a newer climate, and those are the ones that survive. They can migrate, not super quickly, if they have the appropriate conditions and their seeds can disperse far enough and fast enough. They might go extinct if they can't adapt either um, locally or globally, or they can adapt via what's called phenotypic plasticity. And that's the ability of an individual plant to be flexible in their phenology and how they respond to climate. Next slide. So this shift in phenology is only going to get more extreme as the climate warms. And we have evidence that it's really happening across the country with multiple different species. For example, we compared um, bud burst data to local Chicago historical data, and that showed that 19 out of the 20 species that we studied had an earlier flowering time sometime in the last five years. And that was from a few days to over a month earlier than previously recorded. But really, so what, right? What difference does it make if plants bloom earlier, we get flowers early in the season, it's a shorter winter, that sounds great, right? Um, but these shifts really can impact not only plants, but the animals that depend on them, as well as humans. Next slide. 
So shifts can result in what we call ecological mismatches. So that's where a flower is blooming when the pollinator isn't available or a flower is fruiting when um, the small animals and birds that eat those fruits um, aren't around. Um, so if they're not pollinated, they don't reproduce. Pollinators don't have food sources. Um, pollinators and other insects might not be available for birds and other small animals that feed on them. Early blooms can also shift or lengthen the allergy season. And finally, it can impact food crops. For example, there's really been um, significant damage to cherry and apple crops in some years when they bloom out really, really early and then get hit by frost that damages the flowers so they don't produce fruit. So there really are, are ecosystem-wide impacts for this. Uh, next slide. So before we move on to how to participate, I just wanted to check and see if there were any questions about the phenology and the science. We don't have any questions yet, uh, Jennifer, but I'll keep uh, monitoring the chat and let you know at, at our next question break. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Jean Bryan, who is our Bud Burst Director, and she is going to walk you through how to participate. Um, and just as we go through this note, we are, rather than going to the live website, we're going to walk through in PowerPoint just in the interest of maintaining internet connections um, and simplicity. So I'm going to hand it over to Jean now. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to be here. Um, Bud Burst saw this um, uh, ecological mismatch as a real opportunity actually to engage the public in data collection and to expand that data collection um, and the reach and the coverage and to teach people about how their local communities are being impacted by, um, by climate change. So as, as uh, we reach the practical part here, I'm going to actually uh, walk through how you can participate, how to register, the three ways that you can contribute and the new functionality available um, in, in Bug Burst, particularly in our classroom functionality. Um, so next slide, thank you. Um, we ask that you create an account and you can see that you can sign up using any one of your current um, personas um, and including size, size starter, or you can start your own Bug Burst account and um, by giving us an email address. Um, all you need to do to sign up is go to budburst.org and in the upper right-hand corner is a button called register login. It's pretty self-explanatory. So here are the three ways to participate. There's a one-time observation, a life cycle observation, and we have some special projects. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the one time and the life cycle observations. But if you're interested in some of the special projects that we have, um, please again go to budburst.org and you can click on the project tab at the top of the page. It's off on the far right. Anyone can submit observations for any plant anywhere in the United States and Canada, whether you're on a weekend hike or on vacation or you're tracking a single plant that's out your window throughout the whole growing season. Um, any plant in your front yard, whatever. Data can be collected and submitted easily through our mobile responsive website, or uh, we also have uh, PDF data sheets that you can print out and take into the field with you. In the fall of this year, we are going to be introducing a new app that will simplify this process even further and, and really allow our community scientists to collect and submit data um, much easier. So next slide. So what's the difference between a one-time observation and a life cycle observation? Well, a one-time observation, not surprisingly, is an observation you make only once. It's one plant and it's a snapshot of what that plant is doing at that moment when you see it. So you collect the data points on the current status of all the 
phenophases. So that would include what are the leaves doing? What are the flowers doing? What are the fruits doing? And it's not at all unusual to have some, you know, have a nice report of leaves, but you've got no flowers. Zero is a really important number. So be sure that you give us all the points. In a life cycle observation, you're watching the same plant over the entire growing season. So these are plants that you're gonna bump into all the time. They're in your yard, they're across the street, they're in the local park, they're in your schoolyard. Um, and in these observations, you're going to collect dates when each phenophase happens. Um, so when, when did the first flower blossom? When did the first leaf come out? When did the leaves change color? Okay, slide. So this is what our reports look like. For a one-time report, you collect dates on the status of the plant at that moment. These little circles that you see are each of those uh, leaves unfolding, flowers, leaves changing color, fruiting, uh, leaves dropping. So those are the phenophases for uh, any deciduous uh, shrub or tree like the common lilac. Next, please. In the life cycle report, you're gonna watch that lilac throughout the entire season. So again, when that bud bursts, that's a data point. Take a picture and give us the date. When the first flowers open, when the first flower opens, when it's in full flower, give us that data point and send us a picture. Next. All reports are saved to your account and we get the data. So what makes good data? Well, it's pretty straightforward, but in practice, there are always questions. The first key piece and the challenge for most people is the species identification. How do you know what plant you're looking at? Well, there are a couple of ways to find out. Um, there are a number of very decent plant ID apps out there that will help you identify a plant from a photo. There are also websites that will walk you through a question and answer process to help you figure it out. We've got some of those here. Arbor Day is particularly good at identifying trees. If you're old school, like some of us, um, you can always use a plant guide or a dichotomous key um, which are the paper version of websites. Finally, you might not need any of these resources. Lots of bud burst plants are commonly found in your garden, in landscapes, so you'll already be familiar with them, like the lilac, forsythia, black-eyed Susan, even dandelions. Next slide. The next thing that is important for um, getting good data is to recognize what phenophase it is in. Um, this is kind of easy, but people always have questions because it's really not a precise science. The Bud Burst website has lots of resources for helping in determining what life, what life cycle stage the plant you're observing is in, whether it's first flower or mid fruit. Um, different types of plants have different phenophases, which is why we have six different groups um, in bud burst. So if you're observing a tree, you'll be collecting different data than if you're collecting for a wildflower. But don't you don't have to worry about knowing the differences because we're only going to give you the questions for the life cycle phases that are relevant to the plant that you're um, reporting on. Next. Ah, good data, photos. Photos are critical in collecting good data. They help our scientists confirm that the species is correctly identified and that the phenophase is correct. They also help us build resources for, um, for the bud burst community. So if you submit good photos of a plant that, you know, we really don't have any good photos of, uh, we may ask if we can use your photo on our website as an example. Next. 
Any questions coming up? You are doing such a great job of explaining everything. We have no questions yet, Jean. <laughs> Jennifer, did oh. you have any questions you wanted to ask, Jean? <laughs> okay. Question. Um, what was the, Jean, do you remember the first plant you observed for bud burst when you first started doing it? Uh, probably the red bud out my kitchen window. So, um, and it is almost ready to burst. I'm looking forward to the flowers. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll move on. I'm sure we're going to have questions next time around. So, um, yeah. So this is a dashboard. This is um, Jennifer's dashboard. She was kind enough to give us a picture. Um, the website has several features that will help you organize your observations. Um, when you log in, you go to your dashboard where you can submit your new observations or uh, you can edit your existing observations or you can get your top 10 plant list You can see what, um, what Jennifer likes to report on there. Next. You will have, um, if you've, once you've observed a plant, it stays in your account so that you can make additional observations without having to add the information all over again. You can search and filter your observations by species, observation type, or date. You can also edit your observations or add more photos if you like. Next. I want to encourage you that Bud Burst is for everyone. We uh, reach out to families, school science classes, youth groups, community organizations, anywhere that we can nurture community scientists in nature-based learning. Next. Um, in response to um, recent requests from our social distancing friends and partners, uh, Bud Burst has posted over 14 activities for families that they can do at home. It's all about nature for pre-K through eighth grade from identify, identifying plant parts in the kitchen while you're making a healthy salad uh, to estimating the age of a tree while you're using math skills. Um, each activity comes with downloadable PDF file with detailed explanations, instructions, and resources. Blood Burst is also for educators. Next. Whether you are a formal educator or an informal educator, um, since its beginning, Bud Burst has encouraged um, teachers and students to go outdoors to learn about plants. The Bud Burst website includes helpful suggestions and projects for using Bud Burst with um, all levels of students. Um, if we were going to go down the, the uh, side menu there, you would see um, K through K through three four through eight, you know, so, um, and college and high school. And um, also we have um, specific things for informal educators. Um, the heart of our Bud Burst for Educators though is our um, virtual classrooms. Next. Bud Burst classrooms provide teachers the opportunity to have their students collect phenology data in a shared online space. Teachers can, can track student observations, download all the classroom observations at once um, to an Excel spreadsheet. They have the ability to edit or delete student data. Um, and students also have the ability to edit their observations. So you can point something out to your student and make it their responsibility to make changes. Download data from the um, and the students can also download data from the Bud Burst classroom for analysis. Next. So depending upon their unique learning situation, teachers can now choose to either create student accounts or invite participants via email address. Bud Burst classrooms has also added flexibility in selecting species and locations. So you'll notice um, 
we have the teacher created accounts that was uh, that was initially created um, for students who are under the age of 13 uh, for um, confidentiality. Um, but we have now added the ability to invite people via email. Um, and um, we're going to walk through a couple of uh, three scenarios in a few minutes to uh, talk about a little bit more about why we might choose one over the other. Um, we also have in Increase the flexibility for um, species and location identification. So there are a paired where you have a specific plant in a specific location, then unpaired where uh, the species, you have a select and specific species, but, um, and you have selected locations. And then you have unrestricted, which is to say the participants in your classroom can uh, report on any species in any location. So let's look at these ex three examples of how Budburst classrooms might be used and when to pick which feature. Next slide. So here's a school that has a Native Ours research garden. Native Ours is one of our special projects. In this case, each student is responsible for tracking one or two plants. Each student observes their specific plants several times through the fall months, observing both the phenology status of the plant as well as recording pollinator visits. So for, for your Budburst classroom, you might want to decide to create a student account uh, because you're working with students who are under 13. So you maintain the confidentiality of the student and data and because your students may not have email addresses or accounts. You are pairing plants and locations. That is to say, as the teacher, you are putting specific plants in the classroom. So you might have an aromatic aster number two in the South Garden, that plant. The student need only upload their data for their own plant. So they need to find their plant and click on that and then they can load up their data. In another example, next slide. Here we have a group of master naturalists at the local nature center um, and they want to expand the use of native plants in landscaping in their community. Over the last few years, they have planted two species of dogwood and three species of viburnum in the local parks five of the local parks. They decide to track the phenology of these key species so that they can provide local homeowners with a more specific flowering date for that species for their locale. In this case, the project coordinator creates the Budburst classroom and invites all the group members along with some of those homeowners that they've been working with. Um, participants can then create their Budburst account if they don't already have one. Um, and they can make their observation reports in the classroom so that all that data is easily gathered in one place and downloaded for analysis. In this case, the coordinator decides uh, that since they have five key species, she puts those species into the classroom. And then separately from the species, she adds the five locations. Each participant then goes, finds and observes and then reports on one of those species. And when they're reporting on the species, they then select its location from among the five locations that the coordinator has made available. For our third example, thank you. Um, in this case, your students are all confined close to home, which may or may not be close to the school. Therefore, you cannot expect students to report on plants located on or near the school grounds. However, you can expect that they will be able to find a flower that is blooming or a shrub that is fruiting or a tree whose leaves are changing color. There are some, here are some options for your 
club versus classroom. Depending on the age of your students um, and their access to email, um, you can decide whether or not you would like to create student accounts or whether to invite by email. In some cases, it might actually be easier for you to invite the parents um, if you have their email addresses. It's either one or the other at this point. Um, we'd like to be able to mix and match maybe down the road, but um, you, can, you either can create student accounts or invite by email. In this case, because you don't know what's available to your students, you've set the classroom for unrestricted species and locations. So the students will be able to search around where they live and find plants um, for their observations. Um, students can find and report on plants that meet whatever your assignment is um, and what your learning goals are. These three scenarios, by the way, are also available on the Budburst website under Budburst for educators in that area. Okay, I know you have questions now. Car Carolyn, what, what are the questions? Well, actually, Jennifer's been doing a really great job of, of answering them in the chat, but there was one question that uh, I wanted to just have Caroline go through and explain all the ways that they can access this webinar when uh, we're all through today, including the chat. So Caroline, would you mind answering that question for us? Yeah, definitely. So we're currently streaming live to YouTube. Um, so you can find it on YouTube immediately after the web um, we finish recording. And um, we're also going to be posting it on the SciStarter blog and following up via email with everyone who registered. Um, one question I found, saw in the chat that I thought was pretty interesting is um, Melody asked, what zones is data collection useful for? Is the program local to Chicago or is it nationwide? And I know Jennifer answered that already in the chat, but just to make sure it's on our, our public record. Oh, it's, it is, um, we are now working in the United States, which includes uh, Alaska and Hawaii. And we are also um, working in Canada now. You can make observation in, observations in Canada. We even have a new partner in Canada. That's awesome. Just to add to that, um, data from anywhere in North America essentially is valuable. It doesn't matter which growing zone you're in. Um, all of that phenology data is valuable. And I just like to add about the educators section that we've just added recently to our website. Uh, as a teacher, uh, I can't tell you how uh, excited I am and I have been hearing from other educators about having this remote learning opportunity where you can put all of your students into the classroom and then you can collect data that students can collect it anywhere they're at. Uh, so it's not like you have to do it in the school's garden anymore. You can do it in the, in the student's backyard. And then you have access and the student have access to that data that's been collected to do um, student to classroom um, analysis of that data. So it's a really exciting thing. Yeah, that seems like the beauty of Budburst. Like you can do it in the virtual classroom. You can do it on your own as an adult. You could do it with college students, with middle schoolers. Like it's just such a versatile project. Yeah, and I, I'd like to add to that one more thing. All of our data is available online and you can filter it um, in any way that you would like, uh, multiple ways um, and download it. Um, student data is protected, so it's unidentified. Um, so that's taken care of, that's a check off your list. Um, but that's also really nice because then the students could, if your assignment works that way, you could compare data from 10 years ago for some species um, to um, what they're doing now. So I see another question. question from Christine. Uh, she asks, how localized is your location data? Do you do it by uh, postal code, mailing address, or latitude and longitude? It's lat long. Lat long, and then- Or as there, close as you can get. Yeah, there is also an address lookup function on the website. So if you put in an address, it will estimate the lat long coordinates for you. Okay. 
I think those are all the questions for now, so we can continue on. Thank you, ladies. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer. All right, now I'm unmuted. Um, great. So um, just to close, I wanted to share a couple of ways that the bud burst data has been used in research. Um, so this data really is valuable. Um, and has been used to answer some some fun and then some actually pretty uh, interesting conservation issues. So in this first paper that you see displayed here, they looked at um, using phenology data to predict cherry blossom times. And that might seem a bit frivolous, uh, but there really is a significant tourism industry around the cherry blossom festival, especially in Washington, DC that really benefits from this kind of predictive power. If you can say, we know the cherry blossoms are going to bloom on X date, then people can adjust their vacation schedules and that can mean a lot for the local economy. Next slide, please. So on a more conservation focused project, um, researchers have used bud burst data to understand how climate change might impact the spread of invasive species. Um, the question they were asking here is whether or not differences in phenology contribute to <laughs> contribute to the success of invasive species. Um, and by looking at native phenology versus invasive and exotic phenology, what they found was a lot of these exotic species really do leaf out earlier than the natives, which um, gives them a preference in terms of how competitive they are for resources and for sunlight. So really they do benefit based on phenology. And when you take that research and apply it, what it tells you is that in managing invasive species, you have a window early in the season where you can um, really target and remove invasive species while you're not actually damaging the native species that might be in that same ecosystem. Um, so there really are ways that we can use this data to answer important conservation questions. Um, next. So that concludes the presentation. I hope you will consider participating and contributing data. Um, we are happy to answer any questions now, or if you think of questions later, you can email us at info at budburst.org and one of us will be able to respond to your questions. So um, opening the floor for any more questions. This isn't really a question, but it's a comment from me. When you, you mentioned the Cherry Blossom Festival, they do take it so seriously. And it's also really culturally important to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, like the Japanese embassy is involved, like people like plan their whole year around it. So it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. I put in the chat too um, a link to our YouTube recording. So for those of you who are watching, if you want to share this recording with your friends, your family, your colleagues, and get them involved in Bud Burst, um, feel free to send it their way. And while we wait for our last few questions, I just wanted to thank the three of you again. I learned a lot. Um, I also loved looking at all these beautiful pictures of flowers during this presentation. Always <laughs> makes my day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here. And um, yeah, we really do hope you give it a shot. And like, like I said, if you, um, if you do have questions that we don't answer here today, email us at budburst.org. Um, and there is a question, is there data on any of the agricultural crops like apples? I don't have those references available right now. Um, but I do know it was up in Michigan that this happened a couple years ago. And if you do send us an email, I can get you those references. Yeah, far farmers um, use phenology a lot. They might not call it that, but they, they know. All right, I think those, I don't think we have any other questions for now. So everyone, if you think of something later, send it to info at budburst.org. And otherwise we hope you share this recording and get more people involved. Um, thank you again. I think we'll end it here. Yep. And thank you, SciStarter. Yeah, thank you, SciStarter. And thank all of you who participated. Happy Citizen Science Month, everybody. <laughs>